<laughs> well, my dear fiends, it's that time, isn't it? The Halloween time, the time where it strikes the witching hour, eh? Oh, my. It would seem our wonderful haunted grandfather clock is a little off. I think we need to change it around a little bit here. Hmm. Now. <laughs> now. Now. Now it is the midnight hour and it's time for Monster Movie Night with me, your internet horror host, Bobby Gamonster. <laughs> happy Halloween, everyone. Happy, happy Happy, happy Halloween to you, Boris, and to you all, my good fiends. So glad you could make it for our season 11 finale. <laughs> That's right. Season 11 has come and, well, getting ready to go. But, but, in view of that, we're going to have the biggest finale of all time. We're going to have a great Halloween Spooktacular featuring tonight Gallery of Horror featuring Lon Chaney Jr. and John Carradine. <laughs> uh, what a way to end the year, hmm, Boris, with such wonderful spooky patronages and actors such as these. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. We have all our decoration. The Halloween tree outside is all decked and we have our wonderful odd buttons here. Uh, little tchotchkes of Halloween, the little people. <laughs> so, my dear fiends, it seems to be the hour. So, let's go into, or let's type into the Internet Haunted TV one last time for Season 11. Uh, Gallery of Horrors, Lon Chaney Jr., John Carradine. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Don't you just love the haunted internet keyboard? <laughs> so, let's tune in to the haunted internet TV <laughs> for tonight's feature and get the Halloween spooktacular extravaganza going. <laughs> Did your mama tell you not to turn on the TV at night? How dare you? I've been watching you. <laughs>
all down through the ages, certain people have been said to possess certain strange, magical, mysterious powers. Some of those, it is said, had powers for good, and they were venerated. Others, it is said, they had black powers. They were feared and despised. Some of those who were thought to have these black powers were called witches and warlocks. They'd summon demons, make all sorts of magical potions, even call down curses upon people and specific objects. Even whole towns began to feel and fear the effects of curses. People began to be terrified by witches, even potential witches. They were afraid of any curse from any source. Eventually, fear turned to violence. People became more afraid of curses than the physical person of the witch or the warlock. If someone died strangely, he was said to have died of a curse. Crop failures, plagues, everything that went wrong, a curse was blamed. People thought that if a curse was put upon a person, that curse would last till that person died. Or if a curse was put upon an object, that curse would last as long as that object was in existence, unless it were specifically revoked. People lived in abject fear. And finally, one brave man rallied his townspeople and turned on a witch. The violence spread. Everywhere, witches and suspected witches were set upon and burned. The hysterical witch hunt spread to America, where hundreds of people were burned by the fear-crazed mobs, even innocent old men and women who would never harm anyone, unable to reason with the people, met the same horrible death. Some shouting their innocence, some screaming imprecations and obscenities and threats of eternal revenge, and some stoically and calmly and strangely silently meeting their end. One of those who was burned at the stake was a real witch. Let me tell you the story of the witch's clock. last chance, Mrs. Farrell. Are you still willing to relinquish the comfort and security of a modern Manhattan apartment for the roughing wilds of Massachusetts? Think well before you answer. I warn you. Well, I think it ain't a matter of due thought. I've decided that I must stay by the side of my unworthy husband. Where he goes, I go. Well said, Mrs. Farrell. Your husband must be a very lucky man. Oh, Bob, this furniture's marvelous. All antiques, the agent said. Doesn't the history of this old place seem to reach out and touch you? I feel as though we'd step back in time, 200 years. It's only the dust and the smell of age. In a couple of days, we'll have the place all aired out. It'll be better than any apartment on the island could ever be. Is there a dungeon? Yes, down there. Nothing in it, though, but some junk and more dust. Show me. I want to see it. Come on, please. Very well. Your wish is my command. of 16th century lumber and rag. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe some of the first pilgrims used some of these things. Maybe Miles Standish. It's just junk, Julie. Oh, we might get a few bucks out of it out of, out of that town down the road. I suppose you're right. I know I'm right. I mean, this stuff isn't exactly Fifth Avenue quality after two centuries. 
Wait a minute, Bob. I found something. What is it? it looks like a grandfather clock. It's a peculiar old thing. I've never seen a clock like that before. I don't blame whoever owned it, hiding it away like that. But it would go perfectly in the main room, dear. Please. It's really very pretty. You should get used to it. All right, Mrs. Farrell. You went again. One grandfather clock coming up. There. Oh, it's beautiful, Bob. So stately and majestic. It was made for this corner. So well, you're the interior decorator. I'm just the handyman. Come on, let's get this place cleaned up. Darling, it's not working. Well, what do you expect after 200 years? But please, see if you can fix it. Oh, can't it wait? I mean, I, we got a lot to do, and I'm getting hungry. All right. I guess it can't wait. Doesn't seem to be any way to open it, Julie. I, I guess I'll have to break it open. No, Bob. Isn't there a key? None that I can find. Whoever owned it sealed it up real tight. Like they didn't want anyone to use it again. There must be one somewhere. Here it is, Bob. Oh. That's quite a ring. I'm sorry to disturb you. My name's Tristram. Tristram Halpin. Oh, I'm Bob Farrell. This is my wife, Julie. Oh, I say, I'm sorry. I thought the Mailers lived here. I've come a long way to see them. Well, you must have made a mistake. There hasn't been anyone living here for the last five years. We just bought the place and are moving in today. Oh. Is something wrong? No. I should have known the mailers would, would be gone by now. Well, thanks for the momentary shelter. Well, you can't go out on a night like this, Mr. Halbert. Do you have a place to stay? No, I just arrived. I thought the mailers would take me in. I used to know them quite well. I was going to work for them. Oh, my husband and I have plenty of room here. We'd be happy to put you up for the night, wouldn't we, Bob? Oh, yes, certainly. And uh, if you need work, why, we certainly can use your help in cleaning up this place in exchange for room and board, if that's all right. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Do you uh, have any baggage? No, I travel light. And I'll bet you haven't even eaten. Well, it has been a long time. I'll remedy that. have a good wife, Mr. Farrell. Yes. And don't think she doesn't remind me of it. I haven't seen a room like this in a long time. I don't suppose this has changed in 200 years. More like 300. Oh, won't you have a seat? Yes, but it's perfect for my work, the atmosphere here. Would it be rude to ask you what your work is? No, not at all. I'm a writer. Mostly mysteries and the like. I've been fairly successful lately, so uh, Julie thought it would be a good idea for us to move into the country. You made a good choice coming to Massachusetts. I had some coffee on the stove, Mr. Halpern, and I made you a sandwich. I hope that'll be all right. Yes, it's very satisfactory. I'll show you your room later, and then uh, tomorrow we can start to work. Well, thank you. You're kind. You're both very kind. Your local physician. Good morning, Dr. Finchley. Won't you come in? Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. 
I was just passing by and thought I'd drop in on the new addition to our little community. Well, that's very nice of you. Uh, my wife isn't at home right now. She's gone into town with our handyman. Oh? Well, that's too bad. I was hoping to meet her. Yes, that's too bad. Uh, you're a writer, I right hear. I wanted to be a writer, too, once, but got sidetracked somewhere. Well, won't you have a seat? Well, yes. Uh, there's a lot to write about around here. I've got a couple of story ideas myself. I'd like to tell you about them sometime. Well, I'd, I'd like to hear them. Right now, I'm doing a feature article for uh, a major magazine on uh, witchcraft in New England. Witchcraft, eh? Well, there's a lot of it around here. Plenty of burnings. Oh, my, yes. Plenty of burnings. Yes, well, uh, that's what I'm writing about. It was a regular witch court out there. Got rid of a lot of old bags. You didn't like your mother-in-law? Spread the word she's a witch. Before you knew it, poof, no more problem. Those were the good old days, some say. Yes, well, uh, thank you, uh, but uh, I have work to do. So uh, maybe you could come back uh, another time and... Oh, uh, I see it's time to go. Got a busy schedule, you know. But nice talking to you, Mr. Farrell. I'll come back when I got more time. Got a lot to say about those graves down there and about Lucy Mailer. She was the only real witch there ever was. Died 1673. Say hello to your wife for me. Until some other time then? Uh, wait a minute, uh, Dr. Finchley. Yes? I'd like to uh, hear more about Lucy Mailer and the graves. Most people won't talk about it, you know. She was a real witch, all right. Town folk finally get rid of her and her whole family. Buried them all right down the crypt, along with her friends. Then uh, she was the one who lived here. That's right. And Lucy Mailer had powers. Not witch powers, mind you, but magical powers. There's even talk that she enchanted a clock. But nobody's had the nerve to find out, for sure. A clock? Yes. People say it could bring back the dead. Well, I've got to be going now. Nice meeting you, Mr. Farrell. Yes. Uh, goodbye, Doctor. Listen to me, Julie. You cannot, you will not stay with your husband. His cruel and sadistic nature is revolting to you. You want only to leave with me. Do you understand? You will tell your husband. Preston, I've been looking for you. Aaron, you're just in time. Your wife has something to tell you. Well, let me wait. I have something to tell you. Something I think you'll find very interesting. Lucy Mailer truly knew the power of time. Time and life are one. Yes, I know your secret. And I know why you were sent here. But you'll not succeed. I'll see to that. No, no, you don't know the curse you kill us all! couple left here, Hazel? They just left. That's all. Look, 
We got this place at a terrific bargain, so don't borrow trouble. I was just wondering. Don't. You haven't the brain for it. You have the brain for it. Isn't that a beautiful clock? I just love clocks. Thank you. Sorry to disturb you. I'm afraid you didn't hear my knock. I'm looking for the mailer family. Are you chilled yet, my dear Boris? Are you chilled? <laughs> Not quite. Well, we're getting there. You know, for Halloween or any other time of the year, but especially for this time of year, uh, I love bringing out the old... Uh, RPs, well, records, LP, long players, they, I think they used to call them, uh, the, the uh, rec recordings of such wonderful things as the thrilling, chilling sounds of horror and the haunted house. <laughs> uh, it, this wonderful little album would just put you in the mood for Halloween with all the sounds of the night and sounds of ghosts and witches cacklings and other and other wonderful sound effects uh, this was one of my favorite growing up <laughs> now for tonight's feature film the gallery of horror with John Carradine and uh, Lon Chaney Jr. well I thought I'd bring out uh, this one here is is a must for Halloween as well as any John Carradine film. It's called John Carradine Poe with Pipes. This was put out some years ago and uh, yes you can see that uh, Carradine is there in front of the uh, the pipes and he recites a lot of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, poetry and stories like Annabelle Lee and the Black Cat. <laughs> That's another wonderful uh, record to put on the old uh, player if you still have one of those. <laughs> well, tonight, we well, we have Lon Chaney Jr., but, uh, well, Jr., as far as I know, didn't put out any, uh, any uh, vinyl, but his father... Uh, Cheney, Lon Cheney Sr. was the vampire at the harpsichord. Th this was him playing uh, his vampire character, uh, London After Midnight. <laughs> and this is a wonderful tune as well as all harpsichord type music. I love the harpsichord, don't you, Boris? Uh, good old Lurch from the Adams Family. He, uh, he knew how to play a harpsichord. He could really get down on that thing, couldn't he? <laughs> well, anyway, those are some of the uh, records and sounds and treats and thrills and chills that uh, I always love sharing this time of year. It, it, uh, it just makes my heart just go cold with the it was the sounds of it. <laughs> it makes the beat go bonk, 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 bonk. <laughs> Just like tonight's feature, Gallery of Horror, will hopefully do to you. So let's tuck back in and go back to tonight's feature with Lon Chaney Jr. and John Carradine. <laughs> Many stories have been written about creatures of darkness and brotherhoods of evil. These tales have been influenced by European folklore, handed down through the ages and telling of creatures roaming in the woods at night, half man, half beast, and preying on the townspeople. The simple people of a few generations ago, if they heard of a mutilated body found near their village, would run home, gather their families to them, and securely lock their doors. Various things were used to exercise these evil creatures, such as holy symbols, certain herbs, and a few metals. We of more modern times, with our better educations, communications, and police forces, are inclined to scoff at things we do not understand. If a mutilated body were found today, the police would quickly track down the killer by consideration of motivation, opportunity, and means. We, insist that such a deed must have been done by human hand, not inhuman. 
All these old tales had these creatures of darkness to be a brute-minded lot, slaves to the dark powers that possessed them. However, as the average citizen became better able to protect himself and family, the number of these demonic creatures dwindled until only the most clever were able to survive. It was a case of keep your wits about you or perish. Here is a story of one such dark creature who kept up with the times. I call it King Vampire. Well, she's the 13th. Puncture wounds on the neck and left to the rest. And you have no idea who's behind it? No, it could be anyone. We haven't a clue as to who or where or why. But there must be a pattern. No, nope. just killing girls. You know, the newspapers have a name for them. King Vampire. Look here. This is where the girl's body was found this morning. Over here, the one before. Here, another one. And another. See, there's no pattern. Then we're... Obviously dealing with the madman. No, he'd like us to think that, but actually it's quite the opposite. Now, even madmen commit their crimes in an obvious pattern of time and, and place. But this murderer is worse than a madman. He's shockingly sane. With the cruelest, most cunning, criminal mind I've ever encountered. It's almost as though he knows every move before we do. <laughs> Well, all I can say is we had better get cracking and catch this King Vampire fellow, or we'll soon be out of our jobs. Yes, you don't know how right you are. You know, all of London's in a turmoil about these murders. People are beginning to ask questions. They want to know what we're going to do about it. The embarrassing thing is that we don't know what we're going to do. You haven't been able to find a single clue at any of the scenes of the crime? None. The people in that area, thieves, gutter scum, a lot of them, they just as soon see us dead and helpless. Hmm. Well, I don't suppose it would hurt to uh, give it another try. Uh, where was that last girl murdered? Oh, uh, just outside Walmsley Lane. But you take care. They're a rough lot. In Walmsley Lane. Right. Yes, I think I'll give it a go. I don't think. What's up? King Vampire got another one last night. Coppers are just here for it. We're not too fond of the way they're handling the situation. Yes, I can see that. We don't like strangers around here. Who are you? My name is John Brennan. I'm a detective. I don't believe you. Well, I've got papers to prove it, if you like. What good are papers to the likes of us? We can't read a letter. Oh, you're a trusting lot, aren't you? Not when there's a vampire about. Well, that's why I'm here. I've come to help. The law's no help to the likes of us. We don't need you. You need me more than you know. All right. Search all you like. You'll find nothing. King Vampire's clever that way. Well, thank you. Now tell me, who here has seen the face of the murderer? Who can tell me what he, what he looks like? I said, who can tell me what he looks like? Surely one of you has caught at least a fleeting glimpse of him. Yeah, Governor, I've seen him. Well, speak up. Uh, what did you see? Well, the uh, same as everyone else. He's a slight man, all dressed in black, like an undertaker he is, with his hat all pulled down over his face. No, oh, he's a terrible sight, he is, that's for sure. Why didn't you tell this to the officer before? Well, I wouldn't be telling it now. But it was my sister he done in last night. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, thank you very much. Don't thank me. I wasn't doing it to help you. And he was brave enough to step forward. Why are you afraid? Tell me, who has seen the face of the vampire? Who has seen King Vampire's face? Well, 
You'll learn no more here, Mr. Brenner. They've no love for the law. But all I want to do is help them. Do they enjoy living in fear of the night? Would you be willing to find the vampire if you knew that your brother or your father or your sweetheart? No, Mr. Brenner. They are not afraid of the vampire. They are afraid of themselves. But you don't appear to be frightened. Perhaps you can help me. Yes, I can help you. I've seen the man you're looking for. I only got a glance of his face as he ran past. But the look of it will never leave me eyes. Brutal it was, with the look of death on it. I've seen many a dead one, sir, and all have had more life in the flesh than the vampire. But his features. They were hidden in the darkness and the hat he wore. Look for a man with the face of a corpse and you'll find your vampire. Thank you, Mrs. O'Shea. O'Shea. And I promise I'll do my best to rid London of this monster. Thank you again. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Brenner. I wish you luck. Luck is finally with us, Inspector. I have a description of the vampire. What? No, I can't believe it. Oh, just wait a moment. Uh, Miss Park, would you please stop what you're doing there and be prepared to take dictation? Yes, sir. All right, John, what have you learned? Take this down, Mark. Well, first off, I discovered the people of Wansley Lane to be quite hostile as to what we're doing. As you said, they're becoming restless and potentially dangerous to themselves. But upon questioning... A kindly old woman, a, a Mrs. O'Shea, was brave enough to step forward and describe the murder. And the description she gave was not a pleasant one, I must say. She said he appeared to be rather... Mrs. O'Shea, like all the rest. How does this man know? The one woman that might have been able to help. Oh, fine lot of good you did in protecting her. How do you expect help from us when all we get in return is that? Listen, she'd be alive right now if you fools would get out of your shells and go after this monster. We can't do it alone. We need your help. What are you waiting for? Your wives and your daughters to be picked up off the street as a result of this fiend? You better make up your mind and make it up now. Can't you see, Inspector? They hate us more than King Vampire. Yes, yeah, we're wrong, they hate us. We just needed time to catch the killer ourselves. What do you mean? I mean, we caught your vampire without any help from the police. You can't do it if you have not. Who are you? It's judgment day, matey. What do you want with me? These people have preferred very serious charges against you. Want to know where you were last night? Uh, well, I was right here. You're a liar. We're out killing old ladies, weren't you? Weren't you? I don't know where you were last night. Nobody's going to hurt you, but we must have the truth. Well, I was right here. I take a walk through the park every night. What do you think, Brenner? Well, he, he does fit the description that Mrs. O'Shea gave, the, the meager what body and the face. What you think he's King Vampire? King Did Vampire? Did he move enough? Now do you believe he's a murderer you're after? Uh, I, I, I know it looks bad, but I, I killed a dog. A mad dog. Certainly it's more crime than that. You're not only a murdering vampire, but you're a sniveling coward. You killed poor Mrs. O'Shea and all the others. You drained her blood and left them here for us to find. And now you're going to pay for your crime. Oh, stop it. You can't take the law into your own hands. <laughs> Now we'll 
never know whether that was the man we were really after. Good morning, Inspector. How are things going? Oh, not very well, I'm afraid. There have been three more murders since that man was beaten to death. Three more? Yes. You remember he swore that he'd killed a dog? Well, he was telling the truth. We just took a test on his gloves. Then who is King Vampire? I only wish I knew. We've taken in every possible suspect that fits this description. Still no luck. King Vampire is as slippery as he is cunning. Say, I just got a funny idea. I'm really not in the mood for funny ideas, John. No, but suppose King Vampire isn't a king at all. You know, you're not making sense. Well, that's where we've been wrong. Well, everybody's been wrong. The vampire's not a man. He's a woman. That would account for the uh, slight figure. Well, don't you see it? I must admit I've never given it a moment's thought. But, oh, no, no, it's incredible. No woman could commit such heinous crimes. Well, I suppose you're right. Just a funny idea of mine. Oh, by the way, I just dropped by to tell you that I've been reassigned to another case. I'm afraid I have to leave you. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, John. You've been a great help to me, and I've appreciated it. Goodbye, good luck, and I hope we meet again under happier circumstances. Well, thank you, Inspector. I'm, I'm just sorry I can't stay around to help you catch King Vampire. But I'm sure you'll be done with it shortly. And uh, goodbye to you, Miss Clark. A woman. too incredible. I agree, Inspector. It's simply too impossible. Yes, yeah, still, I have a feeling we'll never know for certain now. And history will probably record that King Vampire turned out to be a large, embarrassing question mark. Well, where were we, Miss Clark? Possible means of capturing the vampire. <laughs> do what mother tells me but i never could eat oatmeal until i found oatmeal raisin crisp now this is oatmeal made my way crispy flakes with oatmeal a bit of brown sugar and loaded with raisins and almonds oatmeal raisin crisp it's scary how good it tastes oatmeal crisp oatmeal raisin crisp look mother i'm eating my oatmeal now that's a good boy <laughs> In the days when zombies, werewolves, and other monsters roamed wild, stalking their victims over the face of the earth, everyone was afraid of the unknown. They were called the undead. A dedicated scientist, who some call mad, wished to rid the earth of this evil curse. He was aware of the terrible danger, but he was willing to take the risk in order to understand the workings of these creatures. He hoped to work out a formula that would remove the curses placed upon them and permit their tormented souls to rest in peace. The people of the surrounding countryside heard weird screams and strange noises in the night. Open graves frightened them more. No one would go to such places for any reason. But the scientist was not afraid. He was submerged in his work. But he began to lose the sense of values we all have. He lost his original idea and swung around to a new one. Why not try to find the tiny spark of life that gives these long dead creatures their energy? The brute force they could summon with it was awesome to behold. If one could isolate this spark and give it to a live human, it would give great strength, long life, and good health. The problem then was to isolate this motive power Apply it to a dead person, study it, and give the results to the world. Let me tell you the story of the monster raid. Can you hear me, master? It is I, Desmond, 
I have come for you. If you can hear me, knock three times. are waiting for you in the laboratory, Dr. Savard. After years of experimenting, I've finally broken the barrier. With this chemical and hypnosis, the mysteries of the cellular memory, the secrets of the human mind. James, how fortunate. You're just in time to hear Charles' latest theory. James, this is fantastic. I've been conducting certain experiments with chicks using just the injection alone. Now, I, I built a, a simulated barnyard. Now, the chicks never saw their mothers. I made sure of this. Then with a piece of paper, I cast a shadow over the barnyard. Turned one way, it cast a shadow of a circle. Now, when the shadow of the circle was passed around them, nothing happened. Well, but... but Turning it the other way, it cast the shadow of a hawk. Upon seeing this, the chicks immediately scurried for their coops. Amazing. Hmm. What I really came for, I wanted to invite you to a party at my chateau. A very small, a few intimate friends. You will come. Gee, I'm sorry, James. I, I can't leave my experiments. Oh, but you can go, though, Helen. The change would do you good. Are you sure it'll be all right, dear? Well, of course, darling. And look, you go and, and enjoy yourself. Uh, well, Charles, uh, I'm sorry that you won't be coming. I was hoping to hear more details about your work. However, uh, I'll stop by some other time. I'll send the carriage for you at 8, Helen. Oh, that's wonderful, James. I'll see you out. Desmond might be within earshot. He's always looking around somewhere in the shadows. When I take you away from all this, you'll no longer have to worry about Desmond or Charles either. Charles will have his work. Desmond will have Charles. And we will have each other. Sometimes I wonder about your intentions, James. Do you really love me? What nonsense. Of course I love you, darling. Is something bothering you? I think you're just using me as a pawn to find out everything Charles knows. Oh, of course, what he knows is important. Important to both of us. After all, I, I must be familiar with what will soon be ours. Yes. I must leave you now. I'll see you later tonight. Goodbye, dear James. Until tonight.
Yes. Dear, loving Helen. Little did I realize then that you and James planned to kill me. I remember the day quite well. Well enough for it to will me back from the grave. Faster, Desmond. Faster. My love, my faithful love, awaits my swift return. <laughs> Charles, the medical council at Geneva is certain to recognize you at their next meeting. Well, perhaps, but the most complex of my experiments is yet to be tried. I, I was wondering, James, would you consent to letting me try my theory out on you? Then we could, together, uh, show our triumph to the board at Geneva. Would what? you do it? I'm a little hesitant about uh, acting as a guinea pig for you, uh, Charles. After all, it would be an added factor if I could assist you. Couldn't we use someone else? What about Desmond? No, no, not Desmond. Oh, someone else, perhaps. Gee, I wish it were you. I did not realize then why James didn't wish me to use my formula on him. But I realized it soon afterward to unlock his mind would be to unlock his secret. His and Helen <laughs> oh, yes, Desmond. What is it? Well, what is it? I'm very busy. Sir, I don't know how to say this, but... Uh... Well, come on. Come on now. Hop with it, Desmond. Well, what's bothering you? Well, sir, I've been with you for many years long before you brought her here as your wife. Well, what are you trying to say? And what does Helen have to do with it? Sir, she and Dr. Savard are carrying on behind your back. Terrible it is, sir. Terrible. Helen? Having an affair with, uh, James? Oh, no, that's preposterous. It can't be. Mark my word, sir. I saw it with my own eyes. I suspected it for some time. All right. Out with it. All of it. What do you know? Well, sir, I heard them talking. They were very lovey, talking about how they were going to do you in and take credit for your discovery. Desmond, you've been loyal to me for many years. I've suspected something for a long time. I, I just couldn't face it. Oh, Helen, dear, what are you doing here? I thought you uh, hated the lab. Oh, I, I just thought I'd help you with your notes. Uh, Straighten well, them out. I'll take care of that, dear. I, I'll attend to it later. Uh, if you want to, though, you may uh, tell James uh, that I need him here uh, right now. Ready to proceed, Charles? Who have you chosen for the subject for the experiment? You're, uh, you're going to use it on me, James. Oh. Yes. I decided to have the experiment performed on myself. I foolishly believe that it could do me no harm. 
I was familiar with all the principles of my form. No one could completely hypnotize me against my will. I could only benefit by it. <laughs> and my mind would be far superior after the injection. Then I could decide how to deal with it. I watched Dr. Savard's every move, or so I thought. Well, Charles, this is it. Are you ready? Ready. What a fool I was. He had secretly concentrated my formula to many times its normal strength. when this was over. He'll be dead when we bury him. Have uh, Desmond handle the details. The sooner we bury him, the better. At least no one will doubt it. He's been working very hard. Oh, James, now we can start life over. Together. We'll really live, won't we, James? Hmm? Oh, yes, darling. With the fame... Uh, recognition we'll get from these experiments why we'll be able to live in any manner we'd like yes they buried me my faithful wife dressed in black the lack of tears hidden by a heavy veil and my good friend dr savard who conveniently signed my death certificate standing by her side in deep sympathy <laughs> They did not realize that the highly concentrated injection of my formula had placed me in a state of suspended animation and had preserved my brain, heart, and lungs long after the exterior of my body had begun to rot and decay and yield to the elements. But faithful Desmond came for me as I knew he would. I wonder if dear Helen will recognize me. <laughs> James has used me, just as I told him long ago. I was so foolish to believe him. I see less of him than I did of Charles. Our 
Please don't try to escape. Desmond has already set fire to all the exits. Ah! Ellen, darling, it's your loving husband, Charles. We'll be together forever. I'm so happy that I finally got my Michael Myers Halloween model completed here before Halloween. I thought it was getting down to the wire and I was painting furiously and gluing like crazy. But I finally got it going and here it is on the shelf here at Gargoyle Manor, the Monster Museum, to be viewed and enjoyed by us all. <laughs> I wonder if Michael is coming home tonight, perhaps not only just to Haddonfield, perhaps, but to your location as well. Hmm? Maybe that knock at the door. Maybe that's Michael Myers himself. What do you think? Maybe you should go answer it. <laughs> Medical knowledge has always been a fascinating subject. It took ages to learn each single secret and mystery of the human body. Even now, there are many secrets. It will take ages more before the last one is resolved. Perhaps it never will be. Many hope for steps forward. They have turned out to be not at all what the researchers wanted. Some were disastrous, some were greatly beneficial to mankind, but these were very few. In the great majority of experiments, simply nothing was learned. But the medical men keep trying hoping to solve the riddles. Most of the knowledge that has come down to us has been gained by thousands of hours of patient research by dedicated men and women. Some of the great discoveries have been quite by accident. The researchers weren't even looking for the results they found. Subjects to study have always been hard to come by. The fear of disturbing the human body after death is always present. Those who had learned have been forced to use whatever was available. Let us turn now to the Scotland of the mid-1800s, when grave robbery was the common source of supply for the medical schools. We shall follow the lesson of the medical students as they discover the spark of life. Oh, come in. Oh, Mr. Cushing. Doctor? Uh, Mr. Sedgwick, sir. I invited you here today because of your tremendous interest in yesterday's lecture. It seemed to me that uh, you had further questions to present. If so, what are they? As I remember, Doctor, you said that electricity was the primary force of life. Yes, I uh, had a colleague at Hamburg University. He had elaborate theories about that. Well, can you tell us more about that, sir? Well, all I know is that he said he could bring the dead to life with electricity. Did he succeed? No, uh, they threw him out, and all of his research papers were burned. What was his name? Baron Eric von Frankenstein. Well, where is he now, sir? Oh, no one knows. He gave up his practice and just disappeared. But wait, I'll show you how Dr. Frankenstein started all of these theories. simple electrical stimulus to the forearm. The muscles contract and the hand closes. But my theory is, if you apply enough electrical stimulus over the entire body for a certain length of time, it will rejuvenate the dead cells and muscles, and the dead will live again. Oh, excuse me. Hello? I'll be right along. Thank you. Bye. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I must leave you. But you stay here and study. Ponder the question. 
Life is electrical by nature. But is electricity life? Well, that was all pretty dull. Hmm? Is electricity life? Oh, really? Hey, uh, I've got an idea. What's that, Cushing? Well, a way to have some fun. Well, let's hear it. Shall we uh, bring him back to life? <laughs> Say, that's a brilliant idea. Why not? <laughs> Won't he be surprised? I should think so. Well, sure, why don't we give it a try? All right, all right, but uh, uh, where can we work on him? Hey, how about the old lab in the back? Nobody uses it anymore. We could go there after classes, and nobody would see it. Okay? Onward. Oh, it's Dr. Mendel. Must be. Now, look, you be quiet and let me do the talking. <clears throat> what are you gentlemen doing with that cadaver? Uh, we were just about to consult you on a new project, sir. A new project? Well, I'm always glad to hear that my students are trying to further their knowledge. Uh, we knew you would be, sir. Well, yes. Well, the point is, we were so inspired by your last lecture that... Well, weren't we, Sedgwick? Hmm? Oh, yes, sir. Very, very inspiring, Dr. Mendel. Well, that we decided to do some research on our own. Well, that's wonderful. I'm always glad to hear that my students are taking a real interest in science, going to delve into its mysteries, try to unravel its secrets. Uh, gentlemen, uh, well, would you mind if I joined you in the project? Oh, we, we'd be happy to have you, sir. Why, thank you. Uh, now, exactly what is it? Well, we want to bring him back to life. What did you say? How did you think of such a thing? We want to utilize your theory of uh, electrobiological resuscitation. Well, you uh, always wanted an opportunity to test it. chance to prove my theory. Gentlemen, I, I, I'm proud of you. I'm so pleased that I give you my wholehearted endorsement. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, sir. Very good. Well, don't just stand there. Uh, let's begin right now. Uh, don't stand in the way of research, you know. I'll show you how it operates. A rubber mat. Yes, sir. Prepare is on. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now watch carefully. Just an electrical charge to the muscles. But as I told you, my theory is, with a sufficient electrical charge to the entire body, the dead cells will be rejuvenated and life will be restored. You mean you think you can actually bring back the dead this way? That is my theory, if the body is undamaged at death. Well, excuse me, gentlemen. Lectures, you know. But I'll return as soon as classes are over. He sure gave me a hell of a scare. Yeah, me too. I wonder if this is such a good idea. Oh, don't be silly. Sure it is. He, he couldn't possibly come back to life. I don't know. All I know is I'm beginning to yearn for those stale classroom lectures. This isn't quite as entertaining as I thought it would be. Well, we can't back down now. We're in too deep. 
Yeah, and whose bright idea was it to get Dr. Mendel mixed up in this anyway? Well, I didn't have much choice, did I? Well, anyway, uh, after old Mendel makes a fool out of himself trying to bring this body back to life, we'll all have a big laugh. Then we'll call the whole thing off. And no one will be the wiser. Okay? Okay. He isn't uh, really going to do it, is he? I mean, well, you know, fooling around with a corpse this way? What if the police find out? Oh, be quiet. They aren't apt to find out anything. Nothing's going to happen. Stand by that switch. You assist me, please. Yes, sir. Now, watch closely. Power. I need more power. Give me more amplitude. I guess my theory wasn't feasible. I guess it wasn't meant by the faith for me to succeed. But I was so sure it could be done. Well, cheer up, doctor. You've tested your theory and it, and it just didn't work, that's all. Possibly be alive. But I am, as you can see. Thank you for returning me to the realm of the living. Tell me, what's your name? Amos Duncan. At your service, gentlemen. Amos Duncan. You were uh, e executed for for murder, weren't you? That's correct. You you killed three people with a knife. Correct, again. But I was caught and executed. But now I shall have my revenge. is dangerous. We can't have him leaving here. How would we explain it? Yes, and the police. What'll happen to us? Oh, but my, my career. I, I'll be ruined. We can't say that we brought him back to life as a laboratory experiment. Oh, no, of course not. It's too, too fantastic. Right. We've got to get rid of him. You can't mean what I think you mean. Oh, no, no. You couldn't do that. That'd be murder. Why would it? We gave him life, we just simply take it back again, that's all. No, no, I won't have anything to do with it. No, I, I agree with Dr. Mendel. We just, we just can't kill him. Be realistic. He's just an experiment, nothing more. This way, no one will ever know. Well, I guess you're right. He has to go. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Good, and it's settled. He mustn't leave this room alive. But who's going to do it? Whoever the knife points to. Agreed? Agreed.
Oh, no. I, I, I won't do it. I just can't do it. I tell Either you... Either you do it or he'll ruin all our lives. Your career won't be worth a plug nickel if he escapes. All right. I, I'll do it. Good. Now, I know you want to be left alone. Yes. Get it over with as quickly as you can. Remember, it's all for the better. Come on, Sedge. What was that all about? You wouldn't understand, Amos. a doornail. It's like old Mendel came through for us. We owe him a lot. He sure got us out of a tight spot. Yes, sir. Hey, I don't mind telling you, I was, I was pretty scared. Just knowing he isn't up and around is a big load off my mind. Well, shall we, uh, take one last look at Amos Duncan, deceased? Well, all right. It's Halloween, the night of all witchery, ghosts and goblins, things that bump in the night, that make the children of the night sing, and what music they do make. <laughs> I love bringing out this little gem and treasure I found some years ago. It's a little tin with... Halloween specials inside of it, such as, well, let's see, it has its own tape, videotape, uh, DVD, that is, of, um, of Night of the Living Dead. That seems to be a Halloween favorite of, of everyone's, actually, with uh, George Romero's uh, film. Plus, it's got a few other tidbits of Halloween and tales that uh, that's extra with it here. But one of the little things that I love is this little booklet about urban legends and ghost stories. <laughs> and, you know, well, Halloween, before DVDs and films and spooktacular uh, TV shows and horror hosts. <laughs> Halloween was a time when people gathered around a fire and told stories of, well, urban legend came to be urban legends or ghost stories. A lot of times it was stories within their own family of, uh, of ghosts returning. Uh, so one of the urban legends that uh, was around in our country was about a man who was so grief-stricken when his wife died. They buried her, of course. But before, he was able to say a proper goodbye. And he wanted, all he wanted was a lock of her hair to remember her for the rest of his life, uh, to carry around with him as a memento. Hmm? Well, he decided that, well, he couldn't get it done through the courts. So he decided that he would go out with a shovel. Of all nights, Halloween night, he figured no one would pay much attention to him. Now, this was a long time ago, my dear fiends. Anyway, he dug and he dug and he dug until all the dirt was away from the coffin. 
And then he pried open the coffin, pried and pried, and he finally got the lid off. And there was his beautiful wife. Now, she had been buried, had been dead for, oh, quite a few years. And long enough that she should have been decomposed. However, what happened was there she was, just like she was the day that they put her in the coffin. And so beautiful to him, so beautiful. And so he reached down to get one final kiss and a lock and a cut and a snippet of the lock of the hair. And when he got close and near her, she just crumpled away into dust, into dust and flew away into the night. He had a heart attack and died right then and there. So I suppose in a way he did get to reunite, reunite with her that very night, Halloween night. So my dear fiends, <laughs> if you're passing that particular graveyard, don't be surprised if you're hearing the sounds of shovels after shovels of dirt being dug and of a lovely, a lovely couple sifting away into the night air, dancing, dancing to the tune of their own beat. <laughs> Something to remember, don't go digging on Halloween night, not unless you want a fright. <laughs> Let's go back to tonight's feature, shall we? In the mists and shadows of old folk tales, one story stands out above all others. It concerns frightened people huddled about their fires, not daring to venture forth after dark, cowering in fear of the vampire, a horrible creature that feasted upon the blood of living humans. These unfortunate beings were doomed by the mark of the vampire to roam eternally spread the evil ever wider. The only way to stop them is to track each one to his coffin lair where he must remain during the light of day and to drive a stake through his heart. Once freed in this manner, they were able to rest in peace. There were hundreds of such creatures roaming about, each with a new malady and a strange power, such as ghouls, werewolves, Witches and warlocks, gnomes, trolls, kobolds, etc. Hundreds of them teem through these old tales. The list of such creatures is a very long one. If a person had to go out at night, he had to be a very brave person or a very foolish one. Who could know just what might pop out from around a corner? Or what horrible creature might spring at one out of the shadows? I shall part the mist. Light in the shadows and tell you the story of Count Alucard. Castle, Herr Harker. Good. Let us make haste. I wish to arrive there before nightfall. I regret I cannot fulfill your request with such eagerness, Herr Harker. This is as far as I go. Driver, you were paid to take me to the castle, not halfway. I must insist you do so at once. With all due respect, perhaps if you understood the situation. Situation? What situation? The shroud of darkness that surrounds the Count's castle is no illusion. It is the cloak of the undead. Nonsense. No, Herr Harker, I speak the truth. The castle itself is evil, a living evil. None in my village will go near the castle. I have no time for your local superstitions. However, you seem serious. I am. You are a stranger here. If I had time, I would offer you a rational explanation that I'm sure would satisfy you. However, since you refuse to take me further, I'll proceed alone. You must go. A word of warning. When the clock strikes midnight, one 
doesn't dare go out. I know the roads can be unpleasant this time of year. The winter has been very hard. I know that your journey has probably left you with a great hunger, so I've had a dinner prepared for you. If you would please follow me. You're not dining, Count? Please, don't concern yourself. I have already dined. Well, the Carfax Abbey is excellent, Mr. Harker. 20 acres, secluded, high stone wall, and just on the outskirts of London, exactly what I need. Well, wonderful. Perhaps we can sign the papers in the morning. Not during the day, I'm afraid. I can see you sometime in the evening. I suffer from an ancestral malady, a nervous condition. I sleep during the day, and I'm awake only at night. Your family... Are they originally from Transylvania? No. No, my family came with the conquering hordes of Attila the Hun. They built an empire lasting many centuries around the year until the Turks battered at our borders. What a terrible sight. Those fierce battles, so many of my kinsmen spilling their blood into the soil. Much blood was lost to the invader. Precious blood. A debt that is not yet collected in full. You speak almost as if you were there yourself over 300 years ago. You must forgive me, Mr. Harker. My family bloodline means a great deal to me. Listen. Think what a savage thrill it must be to be a hunting creature. It is uh, late. Perhaps we should proceed with the papers? Of course. Count, you are now the new master of Cossack's Abbey. Yes. But the hour grows late and you must be weary. Your bedroom is this way, Mr. Harker. This is your room, Mr. Harker. My apologies, but you shall have to amuse yourself during the day tomorrow. I shall join you sometime after sundown. Good night, Count. Who are you? What are you doing here? Were you sent to me? No, I came because I saw you. And I want you. I must leave here. Medina, wait. We shall meet again. Medina! Count, the girl, did you see her? You've cut yourself, Mr. Harker. There's blood on your throat. Yes, blood. What's the matter with you, Count? Have you gone mad? What brings you here this time of night? Thank heavens you're all right, Count. A child was attacked in the village tonight. But why did you come here? I followed the attacker here. A woman dressed in white. A woman? A woman dressed in white? The undead, they say in the village. And I'm inclined to agree with them. The work of a vampire. Vampire? Yes. We must hurry. Join us and bring a torch. I'll be more than happy to.
Perhaps we should wait for the men. No, we must go quickly before she returns to her grave. of the crypt. in two groups. Keep searching. We're going on ahead. Look there, Bergenmeister. The cobwebs around the crypt are broken. Wait here, Harker. There's movement within the crypt. Bats. Vampire bats. Come prepared, but how? How? I've heard stories of the undead, of vampires. My loved ones were killed by a menace such as this. This is my revenge. sunrise. great service to our village. No longer will we be cursed by the undead. Were you of any assistance to the Burgermeister? I was. We dispatched the vampire. Well, now the villagers can live in peace without fear of the night. Not quite. Oh, how can that be? There's still the vampire that created the two girls. He also must be dispatched. Hmm. That may prove a very difficult task. Vampires are hard to find, very elusive. I will have to look for him. I know who he is. Mr. Harker, you are much too clever for your own good. And now for your meddling, you shall have to pay. I won't let you drain this village of its blood. I need it for myself. Ah! A werewolf! Ah!
My dear Boris, my dear Boris, did you enjoy that film? The last film of season 11 here at Monster Movie Night? <laughs> I most certainly did as well. I do hope that you all survived through the night. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed the tricks and the treats that we provided with for you. And we'd like to thank you all for being here with Boris and I throughout this whole entire season 11, a whole year uh, of frights and tales of Oh, just chills and spills, but also for enjoying, we hope, the treasures in our museum here at Gargoyle Manor, uh, the Monster Museum, enjoying all the treasures that we have brought out throughout the months this past year and, and, and sharing them with you. And I hope that next season 12 starting in january that we'll be able to share even more treasures with you as well as films that you haven't seen or ones that you have but enjoy watching again and again and again <laughs> so my dear fiends i bobby gum monster your internet horror host along with my sidekick and co-host boris t buzzard want to wish you, each and every one, a frightfully happy, happy Halloween. And until next time, next year, as always, <laughs> keep screaming.